Good morning. Thank you all for joining us for the Ethical Humanist Society of Chicago's Sunday morning program. My name is Sherry Pollack, and I'm a member of the Society and co-chair of the Sunday program committee, and I'll be your moderator this morning. For those of you joining us for the first time today, the mission of the Ethical Humanist Society is to create a supportive and inclusive humanist community that inspires all to be their best selves, sustains us throughout life's milestones with celebrations, memorials, and festivals, respects science, art, and nature, promotes critical thinking and rational ways to solve human problems, and creates opportunities to take action to bring about a better world for all. As most of you know, normally on Sunday mornings, we would come together at our brick and mortar facility in Skokie, but due to the ongoing pandemic, we continue to offer our programs virtually via YouTube and hope that soon we'll be able to be together again uh, in the near future. To help build a better shared understanding of who we are as a community and what we as humanists believe in, we begin our programs with a brief reading or quote. So today I offer you this introduction to the 10 commitments of humanism. This life in this world is our central defining focus. Each one of us is responsible for the collective welfare of humanity, other beings, and the resources of our shared planet. We value freedom, reason, and tolerance, and it's our responsibility to develop this heritage for ensuing generations. The 10 commitments, critical thinking, ethical development, peace and social justice, service and participation, altruism, humility, environmentalism, global awareness, responsibility, and empathy represent our shared humanistic values and principles that promote a democratic world in which every individual's worth and dignity is respected, nurtured, and supported, and where human freedom and ethical responsibility are natural aspirations for everyone. Our Sunday programs address a wide variety of topics, including philosophy, religion, current events, and the arts, to name just a few. Today's program is part of our ongoing programming relating to sciences. It's my pleasure to introduce Joseph Henrik. Dr. Joseph Henrik is a Harvard professor and chair of the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology. His research deploys evolutionary theory to understand how human psychology gives rise to cultural evolution and how this has shaped our species' genetic evolution. Using insights generated from this approach, Professor Henrik has explored a variety of topics, including economic decision-making, social norms, fairness, religion, marriage, prestige, cooperation, and innovation. He's conducted long-term anthropological fieldwork in Peru, Chile, and in the South Pacific, as well as having spearheaded several large comparative projects. In 2016, he published The Secret of Our Success, and in 2020, The Weirdest People in the World, How the West Became Psychologically Peculiar and Particularly Prosperous. Welcome, Dr. Henrik. Thanks, Sherry. It's good to be with you all. Um, can, can people see my screen? Oh, there we go. Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about my new book, The Weirdest People in the World. This came out in September of last year, and I just want to kind of briefly go through it. We'll dig into a couple of the ideas, but mostly I'm just giving you a taste of what's in here. Um, I think a fun place to start is actually with a psychological experiment called the 20 Statements Test. So this is something that psychologists have used uh, in different populations to assess people's sense of self. So normally people are asked to answer this, respond in their, in their uh, on paper usually, um, 20 times. But I'll just ask you to do it three times just to give, get a sense of it. So think about how you finish this statement, I am, in three different ways. Uh, sometimes this is the who am I test. So how would you respond? Now you could, there's a couple of different strategies that people use depending on where they're from and, and across, there's variation across individuals. But I might answer this by saying, I am Jessica's father, I am a brother, so I'm Ross's brother, and I am Ara's friend. So that's one way in which people tend to answer it. A different route I could have gone, and probably the way I would have gone had I done this before writing this book, would be I could answer, I am curious, I am a scientist, I am a sea kayaker. So this latter set of statements actually focuses on things like uh, the three A's. So it's attributes, aspirations, and accomplishments. So things about me, chosen by me, having to do with me, not about my relationships. At the other end of the spectrum are people's 
statements about their enduring relationships. So often relationships they've had their whole lives, things that are important to them. And the way psychologists think about this is how you respond to this has to do with how you think about yourself. Are you more of an atomized self, a collection of attributes and aspirations and accomplishments, or are you more like a node in a nexus or in a network? This is part of, or seen as part of the individualism complex. Now it's not clear whether these things have to go together or whether they've just been brought together by the kinds of historical forces I'll be talking about. The 20 statements test comes from work done by uh, cultural and social psychologists, but looking at anthropology, this idea is prevalent in lots of anthropology going back decades. So this is 1974, this quotation from the anthropologist Clifford Geertz. Geertz writes, the Western conception of the person as a bounded, unique, and more or less integrated motivational and cognitive universe is, however incorrigible it may seem to us, a rather peculiar idea within the context of the world's cultures. So this idea of thinking of the self as a, an atomic unit, and then the world is composed of these other atomic units. Also the focus on the self, the idea of being a kayaker and a scientist, or maybe it's more of a person focus, what might be another way of saying it, but self-focus, concern with the self as opposed to this network of relationships or some larger group. Uh, people who are on the individualistic end of this spectrum tend to be more wracked by guilt. So they're guilt ridden, but they're shameless. So this distinction between shame and guilt becomes prominent. Uh, more overconfidence is also associated with this and greater self-enhancement. So overconfidence is a measure is measured by looking at how much people actually overrate their own abilities, whereas self-enhancement is how much you promote uh, your positive attributes or own abilities. So tendencies for self-promotion. So there's this cluster of attributes. Now I tend to I tend to approach this psychological variation very clinically. Um, I'm not I'm not judging any differences among populations, but I found that lots of people, as soon as they start to hear these traits, they start to think, is that good or is that bad? And so one of the things I like to do with this slide is various people may think some of these traits are good, some of these traits are bad, overconfidence means you're making mistakes essentially, um, you have an inflated view of yourself. So it's really quite, it's quite variable and I would, I would, I think it's a good idea at least for the purpose of this talk to try not to immediately valence every, every psychological trait until we understand. One of the points I'm gonna be making is that different psychological traits are favored by different institutions and different culturally constructed environments. So that there's, there's whether a psycho psychological trait helps you adapt to your world really depends on how your world's been constructed. So at least at that level, uh, this is important. Okay, so give you a sense of variation. So this is a measurement of individualism from the Dutch social psychologist Geert Hofstede. And the darker blue are more individualistic countries based on this paper and pencil survey that Hofstede develops. It's initially used with IBM employees in the 1970s uh, and then later expanded to lots of other populations. I'll just highlight briefly the gray areas because this gives you a sense of our psychological incognito. One of, the, one of the points I make when I'm giving this to academic audiences is that our knowledge of psychological variation around the world is actually pretty limited can see that by the large expanses of gray, which are psychological terra incognito. So if we look at the top end of the individualism scale, so the Americans lead the pack at, at scoring 91. This is kind of a normalized scale that goes as high as 100. Australians at 90 and British at 89. And then you can see there's a vast amount of variation across the world. <clears throat> now, later in the talk, I'm going to be breaking down countries and look at lots of interesting variation within countries. So this is, this is just the, the level at which the data is available at is the country level. But we really want something much more fine-grained so we can explain variation across countries as well as lots of interesting variation within countries. Okay, and so one, just to highlight, one thing that's pointed out here is that Western countries are at the extreme end of the individualism spectrum. So not just one, country, one set of countries among many, but unusual in global perspective. Now it turns out, and this is a research project that really began around 2005. I was working with two social psychologists, Steve Heinen and Arnor and Zion. And we began to put together lots of evidence to show that there's quite a bit of psychological variation around the world. And in much of it, societies that are Western societies, places like the US and Europe are at the extreme ends of the distribution. So just to give you some examples, and, and you'll see more of this as we go, but the use of intentions and moral judgment is varies across societies and is at the extreme in the West. 
analytic over holistic thinking. So it has to do with how you solve problems. I'll give you some more on that in a little while. A non-racial relational morality. So thinking about reality, morality in terms of principles. Dispositional thinking. So assigning disposition traits like honesty or clumsiness uh, to people to explain their behavior. And this actually leads to two uh, areas of social psychology, which you may have learned about if you've ever had a social psychology class. The fundamental attribution error, which is this tendency to focus on people's dispositions over contexts when judging them. That's something that varies and is the, in the extreme in the West. And cognitive dissonance, this tendency to want to be consistent across contexts and, and across time is something that is extreme in the West. So two, so what you can take as basic features from psychology textbooks are actually psychological peculiarities of one particular population. Trust in strangers, uh, uh, conformity varies a lot around the world, uh, as does patience or willingness to defer gratification. All right, so based on the research we did early on, so this is sort of 2005 to 2010, my two colleagues, which I mentioned a second ago, R and Steve, we coined this term WEIRD, and WEIRD stands for Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich, and Democratic. And we coined it, I'll mention this in a second, but we coined it as a consciousness-raising device to alert our fellow experimental behavioral scientists to, to the fact that not only is there a lot of variation around the world in psychology, but the populations most commonly studied by psychologists and behavioral economists and others are unusual when placed in a global perspective. So not only were they missing variation, they were studying a particularly unusual and unrepresentative population. And at the time, and this is largely still true, 95, 96% of all participants in experimental studies come from weird countries. So mostly from the US, Europe, Australia, Canada, places like that. These domains of psychology are not the sort of what people might think of as superficial domains of psychology, but they affect things like memory, attention, visual perception, spatial reasoning, sense, how people think about time, and many other domains. So what many would think as fundamental aspects of domains seem to vary around the world. So really one of my, my, my main goal in writing the weirdest people in the world is how do we explain the psychological variation in the population? So in 2010, we published this paper, in which we, we documented the problem, but we didn't have a solution and we weren't able to explain the variation. So for example, the variation we came up with could have been just experimental artifacts, for example, could have produced variation. I now feel confident that's not the case. Uh, and then the other part of the explanation is not only how do we explain the variation, but how did the populations most commonly sampled by behavioral scientists turn out to be so peculiar? So those in North America and Australia, Europe. Okay, now in, in getting to answer this question, I, I, wrote, an, I wrote another book in, kind of pre in preparation. So that book was called The Secret of Our Success. And this is really a book about human nature and the nature of human evolution. What are the key drivers in human evolution? And in this book, why I make the case there are lots of interesting features of human nature that we share with other apes. The central driving force over the last two million years, probably, of human evolution has been the products of culture. So we became a cultural species where we became increasing reliant, reliance on the ideas, beliefs, values, technologies, practices, ways of doing things, knowledge about where to find plants, how to make fire, how to make tools. This was all cultural information and actually drove the expansion of our brains. So our brains are evolved to be cultural machines. So we're, we're self-programmable because our world was becoming increasingly cultural over these two million years. And the more cultural it became, the more we needed a large brain able acquiring, storing, and organizing all of the various heuristics and motivations and knowledge that were available from the minds of other members of our social group. So that's really what this is about. And what it says is that our, our brains are plastic and we're able to adapt them onto genetically, not genetically, so over development as we adapt to culturally constructed worlds. Um, and this affects how we think and process information and attention. Now, one of the main points of this is that we're predisposed as a cultural ape to be able to adapt our minds to the affordances and incentives and constraints of the products of culture. So one product is technology. So the secret of our success spends a lot of time looking at how 
the evolution of numbering systems, the cultural evolution of numbering systems, of the of mathematical abilities of literacy and writing have can shape our minds, actually shapes our brains, because there's interesting work in neuroscience on that. So technology shape our brains over child development. Um, there's interesting research on languages. So things like not all languages have left and right, and this shapes how we think and what we can do. So our ability to solve problems or the way we solve the problems. And, and things like color terms vary also. But most important and interesting for today are institutions. So once you can culturally learn from others, you can have things like social norms. So you acquire the behavior and the standards for judging others. And then once everybody else has the behavior and the standards of judging others, groups have certain ways of doing things. And this creates an institution, packages of social norms. So today I'm really gonna be focusing on what I take to be the most fundamental of human institutions, which is the organization of the family. And anthropologists have documented tremendous variation in the organization of the family. But I just want to make a couple of points here, a couple of cautions and caveats in thinking about this. The book is rich with this, but I just want to make sure this comes through in the talk. Is that we're thinking here of psychological variation as continuous. And in fact, that's what the data show. You're going to see evidence of this, that it's continuous psychological variation. We expect it to vary along multiple ways. It's not one, you know, there's not one dimension in which this stuff is going to vary. Uh, and throughout the book, and, and actually in this talk, I'll talk about variation among villages, among ethnic groups, across provinces, across states. So we don't want to think about just national level variation. The idea here in the theory or theoretical ideas that come out of the secret of our success, and of course there's a larger field of cultural evolution, is really anti-essentializing. It takes us, it, it provides a solution to how we innately think about groups by creating essentialized groups, assigning them properties, kind of stereotyping them. It suggests that culture is continuous and we measure it continuously varying amongst individuals. And it changes through time as one generation passes information on to the next generation. And this is selected and filtered and, and then goes on to the next generation. So it really eliminates these kinds of essentializing views. And then finally, this is something that we put in our original 2010 paper uh, but still bears repeating, is there is an inclination, I think, it has to do with how people deal with folk generics of, of certain kinds of language, to set up a weird versus non-weird dichotomy in your mind. So just remember that weird is a consciousness-raising device. It's not meant to be a theory, um, and it's, it's not some kind of generic, generic category. I'm actually going to provide a theory that allows us to explain a lot of this variation in a much more continuous and natural way without any imposing any kind of centralizing dichotomies. Okay, now what's important here, and what many people don't realize, is that the families that many viewers probably grew up in are quite different from the families, the institutions that people in other societies, and especially back into history and across space, have grown up into. So these are actually traits drawn from an anthropological database called the Ethnographic Atlas. And this has over 1,200 different societies in it, and these are five different kinship traits. And this is the percentage of societies that have this trait. So most of you probably grew up in families that trace bilateral descent, which just means you trace descent equally through mom and dad. Uh, most societies don't do that. So only 28% of human societies do that. You probably grew up in a place where there was little or no cousin marriage. Well, 75% of societies, cousin marriage is preferred, or at least it's okay. It happens with, with sufficient frequency. So that's a rare trait. Monogamous marriage, 85% of human societies in this database uh, allow men to take additional wives. Nuclear families, quite rare. So 92% of societies don't have nuclear families as the predominant way of organizing families. And neolocal residents. So that means a newly married couple uh, lives independent of either the, the groom's parents or the bride's parents. And so 95% of societies don't do that. So this, the point here is that many of us grew up in an unusual family organization. And if you add all these up and look at the database, you'll see that just over 50% of societies in the database don't have any of these practices. Uh, so that's the majority of human societies, zero of these practices. And then it goes down. And if you dig into the ones that have all five, you find that they're almost all European descent societies. So you'll find French Canadians in there and the Irish of 1940 in there. Um, and then the few non-European descent societies are in places like the Philippines, where Magellan arrives in 1521 and immediately begins, begins preaching against polygyny. So by the time the anthropologists arrive, there's no polygyny because the 
Spanish Dominicans and stuff have arrived and rearranged things, or the same kind of thing in North America. Okay, so this is an interesting place to start because families are probably the first of human institutions that emerged. All societies have these kin-based institutions, and they're the first institution that children encounter when they enter the world, long before they meet higher level political institutions and economic institutions. Okay, so the idea here is that people have to adapt to the world that they, the culturally constructed world that they encounter. So in a world of clans and kindreds and intensive kin-based institutions where people use cousin marriage and arranged marriages and have notions of clans and unilineal descent, most of your relationships are given at birth. There's strong pressure to conform to the roles and expectations, and usually this is roles and expectations vis-a-vis -vis other family members in the network. When people seek new relationships, they're basing it on interconnections to that person, to the whoever they're making the new relationship with. So it relies on that. Meanwhile, in the world of weak kinship, monogamous nuclear families, individuals are forced to make relationships outside the family. They are in a marketplace of relationships. They need to cultivate dispositional attributes. So things like being trustworthy and honest and thinking of it as a part of them rather than a feature of the network world that they live in. And they're going to seek others based on their personal attributes. So we're, both, we're looking for others with dispositional attributes that are complementary in some way. So in this world, trust is based on network embeddedness. And in this world, it's got to be based on dispositions because you don't have enough network ties to, to make it work with the, with the networks, or at least those are relatively weak force. This world is heavy with shame. So uh, this need to live up to the standards of others, to not lose face. Um, and also shame in this world is, cont is contagious. So if someone commits an act that brings shame upon them, it actually brings shame upon their close relatives and even distant relatives like cousins. This is a world of guilt. People are living up to their personal standard and there's relatively few societal standards. Identity here is derived from relationships and identity here is derived from that cultivated self, from those unique attributes like being a scientist or a kayaker or something like that. Okay, so that's just giving you a sense of how and why these psychologies are adapting and diverging create the variation that I'll show you. Okay, so now an important question here is when did this divergence in families occur in European history? And we can ask the question more broadly about the world, but it's a particularly interesting story that anthropologist, uh, the anthropologist Jack Goody, who I'll refer to in a second, um, began developing in the early 1980s. And many people have an inclination without interrogating it too much that this maybe came later. This came after uh, the industrial revolution and, and the spread of factories or something like that. Um, it's actually much earlier, it precedes all that economic expansion. So to bring you into this, I wanna make references to this, some things people already know about. So in English, uh, we use the term sister-in-law. And I wonder if people have thought about where the in-law comes in this word we so frequently use, father-in-law and other kinds of in-laws. Well, the in-law comes from in-canon law. And what it's saying is, hey, she's your sister, or treat, treat this affine uh, like your sister. So she's your sister in canon law. And this is part of a package of things that the, where the church, the Western church, which eventually evolves into the Roman Catholic church, began uh, imposing on European families uh, throughout the early and then latter uh, high middle ages. They also imposed a ban on cousin marriage, which began with just first cousins, and eventually expands out to six cousins uh, around a little after a thousand, and then it actually contracts again. Uh, it doesn't go away, it's still being contracted in 1980. So these are incest taboos, and this is just one element in a, a program that the Catholic Church used to dissolve the complex kin groups that we know were, were part of European, pre-Christian European societies. So some of you may also be familiar with this thing that occurs at, at, what, at weddings, religious weddings. So the priest and sometimes even ministers do this. will stop at one point and ask a question to the audience. They'll say, if anyone can he here can show just cause as to why this couple should not be uh, lawfully wedded in holy matrimony, let them speak now or forever hold their peace. That's actually a relic of an, inqu of an incest inquest going back to the Carolingian Empire, where there would be a last check to make sure the, cu the couple aren't cousins or they're not related in some unhappy way that's gonna cause problems later on. So it's a final check to prevent cousin marriage. All right, the church also bans polygyny, the light 
Everywhere else, Europeans had a degree of polygyny with primary and secondary wives. They try to end arranged marriage. Of course, this doesn't work so well with the elites, but uh, it does work further down the social scale. And this is why uh, in Christian ceremonies, brides have to say, I do. That's very rare. No one ever asks the bride for her opinion. Um, and uh, they also discourage corporate ownership of land and collateral inheritance. So they're trying to tie the, the wealth to individuals and to the lineage. And this is because people can make bequests and the church becomes the richest uh, landowner in Europe based on these kinds of bequests. So anyway, this idea is, uh, comes to prominence through the work of Jack Goody and has been picked up by a number of historians. So I'm just drawing on a standard historical uh, narrative here. Okay, so in trying to explain weird psychology, we're actually gonna start with the Western church. And here I'm just gonna sketch the broad outline of the book. And uh, this leads to the demolition of the intensive kinship groups. So the clans, the kindreds, the arranged marriages, the, the networks of cousin alliances, uh, and breaks them down. And that's gonna affect people's psychology. Uh, and that's gonna lead to the proliferation of voluntary associations. So historians have long pointed out that the high middle ages is a period of unusual proliferation of, of voluntary associations. So they come in the form of charter towns where people are starting new towns, you have to join as a member. There's guilds proliferating, monasteries and universities. There's competition amongst voluntary associations. I think that has an effect on this. Rising urbanization. So Europe passes China sometime after 1200, passes the Islamic world in urbanization sometime after 1500. Increasing occupational choice as people can move to new towns and cities and join a guild and, and, and get an occupation. This leads to increasing spread of per, uh, impersonal markets, which I think has an effect on this. These are kind of chapters, there's chapters on each of these. And so I make the case in the book that it was this change in psychology, which would have been present in some European populations by 1500 or so, that leads to things like representative governments at the national level. Uh, the spread of Protestantism, this unusually individualizing faith. Uh, in a greater innovation, financial markets, economic growth. And importantly, it also leads to the military prowess, prowess that allows Europe to expand, conquer, subjugate, extract wealth from populations around the world. And so it helps to answer this question of where you get European colonialism, how it is that European powers are able to do that. Okay, so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this and uh, try to show you how to, or I've spent a little bit of time on this and now I'm gonna show you how to make this link. Just as a kind of, background behind the scenes, just looking at this uh, plot here. These lines, the red lines, are actually require historical data. So in the book, you'll see that I'm trying to provide historical data for these lines. These green lines are claims that go from institutions, say in this case, family, to weird psychology. I use contemporary data to try to show those connections. So I'm moving back and forth between contemporary and historical data. So to, to fulfill that link that I just showed you on the previous slide, I've got to be able to link the church's the spread of the church to the alteration of the kinship structure in Europe. And I've got to be able to link kinship structures to differences in psychology, psychological patterns around the world. And I ought to be able to go directly. So this is a, these are statistical questions. This is, you know, gonna, we're gonna use statistical evidence for this. So uh, we needed to measure this kinship intensity, this tendency to have these networks of families. So we're gonna go to this anthropological database for that. And we can, using some techniques, we can map the world. So this is kinship intensity around the world based on traditional institutions, circa 1900. Uh, we can also get cousin marriage data. So this is a, an actual proxy of marriages on the ground that are occurring. How commonly are they occurring amongst cousins? We're gonna use that around the world and we can also use it within Europe. All right, and then we can get look at how long different populations were under the church's marriage and family program. And we'll use that to measure things. So here we've, I've taken cross-national data from 17 different variables uh, of, of the kind we've been talking about related to individualism, but also others, which I'll, I'll say more about in a minute, and compiled them into a single scale, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. But so the first thing is globally, if we look at centuries that different populations were under uh, the, in this case, the Western church, we see that they have lower cousin marriage rates. So there does seem to be the expected relationship between years under the medieval church, under in this case, the Western church and lower cousin marriage rates. So that holds. We can use this measure of this individualistic impersonal psychology to show that 
places with higher cousin marriage rates have lower uh, individualistic and personal psychology. So that's just compiling all the variables together. I can pull them apart and, and, and I do that in the book and I do that elsewhere. But that's just one quick way to look at it. And I can also replace this cousin marriage rate with the other index that I mentioned. And then finally, we can go this route. So number of centuries under the medieval church, this is a thousand years here at this end. Uh, so more years under the church, more individualistic and personal psychology in our cases is that it's because of what the church does to founds. Importantly, important test of that is that we can do this for the Eastern church and for the Western church. So this is, this is the Orthodox church over here, which adopts a, a, a light version a kind of weak version of what the Western church, the church under the Pope does. So it doesn't like polygyny, it bans some cousin marriage, but it doesn't deal with the enthusiasm and intensity of the Western church. And what we find consistently is a weak positive effect in the Eastern church and a strong positive effect for the Western church. So that's consistent with this view. So I mentioned individualism at the beginning. This is our kinship intensity index from that anthropological database. So greater kinship intensity, less individualism globally. More cousin marriage, less individualism globally. We can add all kinds of controls if you're statistical controls. So, you know, we can remove the effects of things like climate and latitude and distance to waterways and religiosity, compare only Catholics and Catholics, uh, only Protestants and Protestants, and, you know, other things about agriculture and climate. And, and so this result holds. It's quite strong. This is the number of years under the church. So that's a thousand years again. And here, just looking at individualism, you can see centuries under the Western church leads to high individualism. Under the Eastern church has a weaker effect, but it's in the expected direction, which is kind of what we'd expect. If you've taken a social psychology class, uh, you might have heard of the Ash conformity test. It's a measure of people's inclination to go along with peers, which is considered a very positive trait in many places. People in more individualistic societies don't tend to see conformity as positive, but that's just because of their cultural milieu. So it reflects your uh, ethnocentric biases. Um, so, so greater kinship intensity, more conformity on the ASH test. So people are more conformist when the, their families are these intense networks. More cousin marriage, same story. More years under the church, less conformity in the ASH conformity test. So this is neat because it's an experimental measure and these are all university students. So everyone is well-educated, literate, all that sort of stuff. All right, another interesting one is analytic thinking. So psychologists have long distinguished analytic thinking from holistic thinking. Analytic thinkers tend to focus on objects, assign properties, put them in categories and explain things that way. Holistic thinkers look for relationships uh, and they're not concerned with um, clear and distinct categories, they like fuzzy categories, they're fine with that. So a simple way to measure this is uh, with this, you take a target image like this rabbit here, and you ask people, does the rabbit go with the wolf, or said dog, or does the rabbit go with the carrot? And analytic thinkers tend to say, well, rabbit, dog, both animals, put them together, clear, distinct category. Uh, holistic thinkers tend to say rabbits eat carrots, so functional relationship, put those together. And so you give people a whole bunch of these and you can get a score for each person and then you can get a score for different populations. And, and uh, you know, and just again, getting to the, you know, is analytic thinking good or bad? Uh, weird people tend to think analytic thinking is good. Um, other people tend to think it's not so good. Um, some problems are benefited by analytic thinking. I mean, uh, yeah, analytic thinking. And other kinds of problems are better solved with holistic thinking. And, you know, if you're gonna put together a team, you would want both analytic and holistic thinkers. So it's a, it's a complex answer to, to say what the, which one's better. Okay, so if we look at analytic thinking, more cousin marriage, less analytic thinking. And so it, it so happens there's not very much variation in the KII, so I'm gonna show you that. More years under the church's marriage and family program, more analytic thinking. So again, following the same patterns, we see the same patterns again and again. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip this one. So digging in further and looking at the expansion of the Western church, here we want to analyze variation just within Europe. So what my colleagues, uh, Jonathan Schultz, Jonathan Beauchamp, and Duman Barani Rod did was we, we created a database that had the G GPS location of bishoprics as they spread throughout Europe and the location when the bishopric was founded. And that allowed us to, to assign 
a dosage of the number of years a region of Europe was under the church's marriage and family program. And you can see it ranges from zero to about a thousand. We have the Carolingian Empire marked out here and the Iron Curtain marked out, just two important historical borders. You'll note in, uh, there's a lot of variation here in uh, uh, Italy and Spain also has interesting variation. This is because there's Islamic powers are in control here and here for a long period. And the Byzantine Empire actually controls parts of Southern Italy for a while. Okay, and what we find, so we have this social, this European social survey and we're able to pull out measures of uh, trust, fairness, conformity and obedience and individualism. So 200,000 people, 440 different regions. We have each region, we have a uh, number of years under the, uh, under the church based on the diffusion of bishoprics. And what we do is we hold the countries constant. So all of the effects I'm telling you about uh, get rid of, you know, whether you have national, national wealth differences, um, anything about the healthcare system is, is absorbed by this. So anything that varies across countries is, is not part of this. So we find that individuals, Europeans from regions that were more exposed to the church show greater trust than Europeans who were in regions less exposed to trust or less exposed to the church. So greater impersonal trust, greater impersonal fairness, less conformity and obedience, again, comparing Europeans in the same country who come from places that were more or less exposed to the church and greater individualism and independence when you had longer exposure to the Roman Catholic church. Statistically, we can hold constant income. So we're only comparing people from the same income bracket, only comparing people from the same education bracket. We can control for things about Roman history and climate, initial prosperity of the region, um, and other kind of political factors here, which I'll, I'll leave. We can also do the analysis only looking at socialist Europe. So forget Western Europe, France, and those places. And let's just look at uh, the far side of the Iron Curtain and just compare the former Soviet areas. And we get the same answer there. So it does seem to support the idea that the church had a big effect, but did it operate through this kinship thing that we said? So I could show you evidence that the church powerfully influenced the frequency of cousin marriage in 20th century European regions. Uh, but for today's purposes, um, I will show you that uh, more uh, higher rates of cousin marriage, that's this bottom one, you can't, I seem to be having some Seems to be a little cut off here on the slide. Uh, greater cousin marriage leads to less individualism and independence. And here you can see I've marked out the countries that we have. So we have Italy, Spain, France, and we put Turkey on there. Turkey always anchors the end of it. But it's interesting because Turkey's had no exposure to the papal church, but um, they're still on the line. So once you know cousin marriage, you don't need to know anything else. Uh, it's kind of interesting. And so more cousin marriage here, less impersonal fairness. Again, Turkey riding the bottom here and explaining the variation within places like Italy and, and Spain. Uh, same thing here with impersonal trust and then greater conformity and obedience. So more, con more cousin marriage, more conformity and obedience. And so you can explain the variation here within France. Look, there's France lining up there. There's Turkey lining up there. So that's just within Europe. You can even zero in on Italy. So we have data on cousin marriage from Italy's 92 provinces. And here you can see it here, high cousin marriage in Southern Italy, especially high in Sicily, Sardinia, uh, lower in the North. And here's voluntary blood donations to strangers. So this is a measure of this impersonal psychology, willingness to trust strangers. High blood donations in the North, low in the South. So what we find is that, pro Italian, so just comparing Italians with other Italians, uh, places with high cousin marriage have fewer voluntary blood donations, more corruption, less impersonal trust, so they take more loans from friends as opposed to banks and less, uh, more, ca more wealth in cash as opposed to, uh, uh, and use fewer checks. So these are just different measures of this impersonal trust. Um, using checks, not using checks is often seen as, as related to low trust, certainly within Italy, within Italy. And keeping more of your wealth in cash, not trusting financial instruments and banks is also associated with this. So you can even explain the variation just within Italy using this approach. These are just some plots, uh, which I won't spend too much time on, but more cousin marriage, there's the blood donation. This is lower blood donation per, per 1,000 people. And uh, more of your wealth in cash. So a strong relationship between cousin marriage there. And here we can control for each person's income. So we're only comparing people of the same income, same wealth and same education. So it's not the sort of usual suspects 
uh, income and SES and whatnot. Okay, so just a point about this. So what I'm trying to, one of the things I'm trying to convey here is uh, this allows us, this approach allows us to get beyond sort of a centralized notions of uh, cultures. So if you have a theory that it tries to explain this variation, you can show that the variation is continuous and relatively recent in the sense that this has to do with historical changes that really emerge within the last thousand years. So it's not anything particularly deep. It's changing slowly and continuously over time. And of course, there's lots of interesting variation as you kind of zoom in on, on more specific populations. We gradually zoomed in from the globe to Europe to Italy. All right. In the book, I performed the same exercise just focusing on China and just focusing on India. And you can use the same basic approach to explain variation within those places. My current work is actually explaining variation among U.S. counties. So the U.S. is cool because there's lots of county level data and we can do similar things there. OK, so I've tried to focus on that bar and that bar. Um, if I had more time, I'd, I'd talk more about that bar and that bar. There's good evidence there. But just to mention something about this bar here. I make the case that this changes in psychology leads, helps us understand why the European expansion occurred. So why after 1500 do the Spanish are able to, able to go to Mexico and conquer the Aztec Empire and the Aztec Empire doesn't come to Spain and conquer the Spanish, right? So what led to the organizational, political and other kinds of uh, things that gave the, the European powers an advantage as they expanded around them? And then, of course, things like representative government, the details of the institutions need to be explained. Uh, Protestantism, this kind of strange individualistic faith, the emergence of science, highly analytic, law-based. There's a whole bunch of features of science which seem to come out of this psychological pattern. More rapid innovation, the growth of financial markets and economic growth. All right. Um, so I talked about this psychological iceberg, and these are some of the traits that I talked about. Uh, just to mention the, the, the positive traits thing, I, I mentioned that we're thinking about these traits as allowing people to adapt to different kinds of institutions. I'm emphasizing the family structures in this talks, but I, I mentioned markets and urbanization, and things like that. So one way to get at this would be to think about whether you would teach it to your kids and whether you're going to emphasize your kids to be conformists really depends on the kind of world they're going to face. So if they're going to be chomped, smacked down for being a nonconformist, then you're probably going to encourage conformity. If that gives them an advantage, being unique, setting themselves apart, uh, then you might want to teach them more towards non-conformity. So just trying to make that point again. There's a tendency to, to valence these traits because if you come from a weird background, some of these look good to you and some don't, uh, but that's just your weird psychology. Okay, so final point, just uh, briefly here, I want to make sure we have time for questions and everything, is... Uh, I spent a chapter trying, so one of the things you need to do if you want to explain the massive expansion of wealth uh, and life expectancy and a bunch of other things that most people would say is good that occurred after 1800, um, historians agree, I think largely, that you need to explain innovation. So, you know, inoculation start, late 18th century, steam engine, uh, oh, print, well, not printing presses much earlier, but um, anyway, you get this stream of important innovations and science begins to really crank at that point. So how do you get that? Well, in the secret of our success, I, I make the case in a variety of lines of evidence that one of the keys to generating innovation and driving this cumulative process of cultural knowledge forward is the free movement of ideas among minds. So you need cognitive diversity and you need widespread sharing because most ideas are recombinations of other ideas and so they're brought together. And the case that I make is that over the last thousand years in Europe, you have social changes that are going to foster this recombinative process, so the emergence of the collective brain. So greater urbanization, it's well known that cities are uh, hubs or centers of innovation. And in fact, it's nonlinear, so larger cities are even better at generating ideas than, than proportionately smaller cities. Uh, so there's extra advantage to urbanization. Residential mobility, so people need to be able to move around. One of the interesting features of European craftsmen is that after you did your apprenticeship, uh, which there's a features of apprenticeship which support this as well, but then you had to go into the journeyman phase and you'd move around. You're basically taking ideas from different master craftsmen to different master craftsmen. It's kind of like a postdoc. Uh, so that's an important stage. And it's, it's this fluidity that I think actually drives innovation. You get the emergence of professional societies. 
So people are getting together just for the purposes of sharing ideas, not unlike this group, uh, and this then can, can foster more rapid sharing of ideas. Widespread literacy, which I make the case is driven by Protestantism, the printing press with more availability of books, which if you're more literate, then you can spread more ideas. There's a lot of good evidence for that that I review in the book. But crucial to making those social changes work, you need these psychological changes. So greater trust and cooperation with strangers is going to fuel this process. More individualism, so setting yourself apart and treating others not as, not as a node in a network where you're judging them, you know, I judge you based on your father, or I judge you based on your brother, but I'm going to judge you in, in isolation. So that's part of individualism. It's part of the story here. And nonconformity, having, having a different idea that diverges from the norm can be good in some institutional environments, not so good in others. So the degree to which people see that as a good thing uh, is going to foster this recombinant process. Preference for novelty, breaking with tradition is all part of the kind of psychological changes I've been talking about. And greater tolerance or differences. So that's related to trust in strangers and um, individualism. So one piece of evidence I discuss in the book is that uh, European towns vary in their tendency to oppress their Jewish populations and have pogroms. Those towns that had fewer of those and did that less actually prospered faster. You can see towns take a nosedive after they have a pogrom. So it's, it's bad for your economics to do that. This actually led to probably religious freedom in Philadelphia when it was first introduced to, to America. Okay, and then finally, I spend a lot of time, uh, not, I spend some time in the book, and lately I've been spending a lot of time making the link between migration and innovation. And so the evidence now coming out of economics is really crystal clear that immigration is a huge driver of innovation. People coming from diverse places with diverse ways of thinking uh, really fuel, and they make the locals, the sort of native borns, uh, more innovative than it would otherwise be. And there's great cases where the U.S., for example, cut immigration and it, it, the patents drop, right? You can see you can see patenting drop exactly in the, the domains that the immigrants would normally uh, create patents in. So it's, it's very clear. <clears throat> okay, so just uh, some closing up here now, last slide with some take-home messages. So one of the big points of the book is actually that we there's a tendency within psychology and other disciplines to see psychology as something fixed, that there's this, this thing called psychology and that everything else is built around a, a universal fixed human psychology. And that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing that people are able to some degree, at least that's not to say that there's not a human nature, but to some degree, they're able to adapt their minds to the affordances, incentives, constraints um, of, of the institutions they have to, to deal with. So it's just part of our heritage as humans to be able to do that ontogenetically. All right, so we need to think uh, differently about history and cultural variation. And it, it does help affect how we think about some of our modern formal institutions. So things like democracy and our cherished values, what some people might call enlightenment values. <clears throat> doesn't mean enlightenment values are wrong, but they're much more of a product of a kind of what I call in the book a dark matter of new ways of thinking that make those a lot easier to think. So in the book, at one point, I say that, you know, the Enlightenment thinkers were just the intellectuals and writers on the scene when this way of thinking had trickled up and began to dominate elite circles. Well, it kind of spreads out from the middle class. So, okay, and the kind of perverse and I think fun part of this is that all of this is that an accidental byproduct of a set of peculiar religious taboos on sex and marriage that kind of unwittingly reorganizes the, uh, the family structure. Okay. Yeah, so that's that's all I had to say on that. Thank you so much for a really fascinating talk. Before we move on to the Q&A, we will take a brief video interlude while we pass the virtual basket. Um, it's through our generosity that we show how meaningful our Sunday morning programs are. We encourage a donation of $5, but any amount that you are able to give is greatly appreciated. And donations can be collected at ethicalhumanistsociety.org slash donate or through Zelle to donate at ethicalhuman.org. <laughs> 
we are back and we have a few questions ready to go. First one is, have you tried to explain trust in the European Union as an institution using your kinship measure? Building trust is a huge issue for the future of the EU and whether it can persist or will crumble. Yeah, I don't think we've, we've tried. So um, I guess we could look for whether there's survey questions about trust in government or trust in the European Union. We focused on sort of trust in strangers, trust in other people. So we used a generalized trust question in Europe, but that's a good idea. <clears throat> Do your findings shed any light on the extreme political polarization we now see in the US? Yeah, so uh, that's actually what my lab has been working on. And um, so everything I'm about to say is preliminary uh, and should have an asterisk. What we've done is we've tried to look at, well, the way we started, we, we started trying to explain uh, voting for Donald Trump in 2016 and 2020. And what we found is that there's data on people's moral psychology. So I briefly alluded to this in the talk. There's uh, a, a psychologist, two psychologists, John Height and Jesse Graham. And they've developed a way of, of kind of measuring people's moral psychology. And you know, if you take all the questions that they ask, you can kind of smush it down into a scale that runs from people more inclined to, uni to moral universalism. So concerned about justice and fairness uh, all the way down, or then the scale goes to another end, which is people who are more uh, morally parochial. So they're more concerned about their local community and they're concerned with hierarchy, traditional values, things like that. So, we found tremendous variation across U.S. counties, and, and this is building on the work of the economist Ben Anke. So Ben Anke has this paper where he shows that uh, counties that have more moral parochialism are much more likely to vote for Donald Trump. And in fact, Trump's support is, uh, it's, this is over and above like Republican support. So if you, if you, hold, constant, if you, if you hold constant the votes in different counties for John McCain or Mitt Romney, this is the extra support that Trump gets when he goes over and above what, what Mitt Romney and John McCain got. So that's, so it's along this moralist moral scale. So now what we've been trying to do is explain what the variation in this uh, moral psychology and at least the, the little bit of data. So we only have data from 2008 on the moral psychology scale, but it does change over time. So the polarization that we see is actually a polarization in moral psychology. So you can see it changing, it's spreading further apart. So people are becoming, they're moving to the two ends of the scale, either more universalistic or more parochial or communitarian, some people like to say. And uh, you can see this in people's donation patterns and, and lots of other ways. So we've been looking, okay, what explains that? Well, two of our hypotheses that we're still trying to run down, but at least there's some preliminary reason to think they might be the case, is that uh, there's just been decline in residential mobility. So the U.S. has always been very residentially mobile, but for the last 20 years, that's been declining. So some people are staying in their county. They're maintaining these kind of networks of relationships. So those get stronger over time. That could potentially generate this shift in psychology. The other interesting one are rising climate shocks. So in the last 20 years, the number of uh, fires, hurricanes, all that kind of stuff has increased. And we have evidence from other research to suggest that these kinds of shocks actually cause people to become more parochial. So they bind more tightly to their communities. So rising climate change will probably initiate more parochialism in the places that tend to get whacked by climatic events. Um, so those are the two ideas we're working on. Do you think diplomats need to be trained to appreciate kinship differences across countries? And does the failure to do so account for any diplomatic Im impasses? Well, I haven't looked at any specific uh, diplomatic impasses, but I think in general, being aware of the psychological variation around the world and having a real sense for these kinship differences could potentially help in lots of domains. I'm not an applied researcher, so I haven't tried to make any policy recommendations or anything like that. Uh, on this kind of thing. But, you know, if you look at things like um, the imposition of Western style institutions, even if it's something like, you know, when the, when the Americans conquered uh, Iraq, they had to, they put in a traffic code for Baghdad and they used the Maryland traffic code. 
Um, it's turned out to be the case that Baghdadi drivers don't drive like people in Maryland. So, the, the, you know, you might have wanted to have a code specifically for the for the way people drive in a particular place. So that's part of a more general problem, which is you can't assume institutions that are well functioning in one place are going to be well functioning in another place. And then having a sense for the psychological variation can be important for thinking about the kinds of institutions that different societies could develop or adopt or adjust. Does the treatment of nonconformist in any social construct, kinship or whatever, provide any insight into the structure itself? Um, the treatment of nonconformists. Yeah, I mean, well, so the, the big one that I think anthropologists have long hi highlighted is how uh, people who have what, what, what Westerners might call mental illnesses are treated. So in lots of places, this is a member of your network and they'll often figure out some way within the family network to, to, uh, to handle that, uh, as opposed to saying, well, let's set up an impersonal institution and put this person in an impersonal institution. Uh, so that I, that I think reflects in the, the differences in how people think about these things. Uh, you can make the same thing with the uh, elderly. So do you, do you set up a place in your, in your house for your old parents or do you um, encourage them to, to get live in a separate residence at an old person's home or something. Can you describe a bit of the process it takes to build this kind of research, uh, to build this kind of research work? Specifically, I'm interested in how you set up your hypotheses and select data models to use in analysis. Well, so it's a it's actually an effort that involves lots of co-authors. So the initial uh, initially got interested in this because we were working on this uh, this paper that I mentioned in 2010, which is really just a review of all the cross-cultural experimental data that we could find. So that was kind of setting up the problem. And then I, I was, you know, beginning to think of the kinds of explanations, and I had already developed these ideas that people's minds should adapt to different institutions. I had already done work on markets. So I began thinking, well, what are the other most important institutions? And then it dawned on me that, well, the most important institution ought to be the family because that's the one we encounter when our brains are most plastic. So as young children, we're trying to navigate families. We're learning about how to navigate a family. And then I, I discovered this book by Jack Goody, which I then discovered. I kind of knew about it and I read it really closely. Uh, and, and that was a real inspiration for me. And then uh, different parts of the book are done with different sets of collaborators in the sense that I'm drawing research I did with different people. It's a, it's a single author monograph. But um, so in the stuff that I talked about today, the stuff done, done with Jonathan Schultz, Jonathan Beauchamp and Dumani Barani Rod, uh, we're using approaches from economics to try to establish causality or at least eliminate alternative hypotheses as much as possible. And so we're, we're estimating tons of statistical models and we're trying to put in all kinds of different controls and stuff to isolate those. Uh, so really using techniques from economics in that case, which, you know, I've kind of been, I've been fortunate in being able to surf around the social sciences. So I've been a professor of anthropology and of psychology and of economics before I came to Harvard where I'm in evolutionary biology. And so for that purpose, I would say the tools in economics are best. For other purposes, I, I prefer the other social sciences. If Catholicism inadvertently begat Protestantism, can we extend that to say that Protestantism inadvertently begat secularism? <laughs> uh, that's, my, that's my take. Uh, I, you know, I'm always nervous, I, so I'm, I haven't done research on that, right? I haven't put my laser beam on that question and zeroed in on it. But in the course of writing this and reading about Protestantism, there's this sense in which, you know, Protestants, they're highly individualistic, they're, they're focused. And one of the things that I emphasize in the book is that everybody has to learn to read the Bible for themselves. And then they're allowed to make their own interpretation about what the Bible says. And I think that opens the door, right? So maybe my own interpretation is this are just interesting stories about the past and uh, their truth value is questionable. Uh, so I think that opens up to the door to atheism and agnosticism and all that kind of stuff. So it's, you know, once you open that door, then, then all the, all the horses run out of the barn. But uh, yeah, so, so I, I agree with that. I mean, that's my, that's my non-expert thinking. How would you instruct a politician, say Biden, who wants to reunite the country to govern uh, to govern in light of the results you described about polarization? Is there some approach that has not, uh, that has not been tried? Uh, yeah. Um, 
Well, I don't know if I'm a good person to give advice to President Biden, but uh, one is this approach has been tried, but it's always good to keep in mind, which is to learn how to talk to people who don't have the same morality as you. Uh, so my colleague, John Haidt, uh, has you know written the best stuff about this, but just learning how you know getting inside other people's heads, learning what's important to them, and recognizing that they they have a somewhat different way of thinking about the world than you, and trying to figure out the best way to to communicate that. Uh, the other thing is you know if we're right, anything that would increase uh, residential mobility would would bring the country together, uh, especially in the counties that are most hit by by this low residential mobility. And, any, and, and programs, institutions, whatever, to mitigate the shocks of climate change are going to mitigate the, the, effect, the psychological effects of these you know, storms, fires, et cetera. Your early comments seemed to point to a need to de-weird our data collection to avoid Western bias in our future research. Is this a correct understanding? And what efforts are... Uh, working to address this? Yeah, uh, great question. Yeah, so that, that has been, uh, the, you know, one of my kind of my one of my main emphases since the 2010 paper. And so the 2010 paper, which is called The Weirdest People in the World with a question mark at the end, uh, really is pushing people to diversify their samples. And we, I think we've had a big impact or uh, it's we, but we're part of a stream uh, that that really has altered economics. So economists more than anybody else are taking advantage. I mean, because there's development economists who are interested in, in working around the world and explaining economic patterns around the world. They're really leading the way now on uh, recording and trying to explain psychological variation. I thought, that, I thought that we would have the biggest impact in psychology, but the nature of psychology seems to be that it's hard for graduate students and young researchers to take the time necessary to be able to do and collect data around the world. Um, there's this tendency to need to use online samples now because they're fastest and easiest and most convenient. And there's a lot of pe uh, pressure in psychology, more than other disciplines, to publish a lot of papers quickly. So I think we've had less effect there just because of the institutional constraints of it. When I talk to audiences uh, in psychology, people seem to recognize the problem and they want to solve it. Uh, but it's just hard logistically given the current structure of the discipline. But yeah, for sure. So we, I mean, you know, so we, we paint this picture in, in the two, 2010 paper where we want, you know, networks of labs all around the world, you know, of course, co collaborations and coordinations with people in all these different places uh, to collect the same kind of data in diverse societies. And also taking into account that the theories that we're using have been constructed in weird societies. So, you know, using the, uh, the the local knowledge to think about, well, how else can we think about this? How would you think about us? That kind of thing. Um, us meaning the place where I'm from. When you present this in academic settings, what are main intellectual challenges skeptics of your work raise? That is, do respected academics raise concerns that kind of niggle at the back of your brain? Well, yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of different, so the economists will raise concerns, the degree to which I showed you a bunch of data, which I think support the idea that there's a link between kinship and the psychological measures. Um, our efforts there are built around, my confidence, I guess, in that is built around using many different data sets and getting the same answer. But the economists would say, and, I, and this is true, uh, that, that we don't have a natural experiment that there's nothing which somehow caused one society to get randomly assigned one kinship system and another society to get randomly assigned another kinship system, independent of everything else in the culture. So there's this challenge of isolating kinship system as opposed to all the other stuff that it could potentially be. So we've done our best on that and there are, uh, you know, comparing societies that are close together or related in history, but just seem to differ by, by the kinship structure. But um, that remains open. I'm going to bring these together in a second. Now, that, now there's, of course, historical concerns because uh, in the book, the, the, my conclusions about this marriage and family program, which is, you know, lots of historians have worked on this, but we don't have census data to show us family structure or something uh, going back to 500 CE, right? So we have the fact that the church is having all these meetings uh, and they're expressing concern about incest, meaning cousin marriage, 
So there's that kind of evidence. There's little scraps of evidence around 800 or 900 suggesting people are being put into nuclear families. A little bit more in England gets pretty good, 12, 1300. Um, but the data showing that Europeans live in small monogamous nuclear families isn't really good until the end of the Middle Ages. So you have these kind of bits and scraps. One key piece of evidence comes from language data. So the kinship terminology of European languages changes, becomes the modern version. And it happens first in the, in the Latin-based languages, so Italian and French, and then later in the Germanic languages, but roughly consistent with, with what we'd expect based on when we think the, these changes got there. So historians will rightly say, well, look, you, the, the evidence here isn't knocked down. There's a couple of other ways to kind of piece this together. One historian who I really respect, Dan Smale, uh, he thinks we're right. I mean, he thinks it happened later. So he thinks the action really happens around 1100, 1200. I mean, if he's right, it doesn't change my story that much. It just would mean that the period where I think there's a lot of action, which is the Carolingian Empire, um, maybe there's something about the historical sources that are, are misleading me there. Um, so what we've done is we have a big project. And so we're trying to get funding for it now. But this will code the corpus of Latin texts, looking for evidence of changes in kinship terminology. And we think we can get some psychological evidence out of these texts. So that's one of the things we've been doing in the U.S., so we take the corpus of U.S. newspapers, which varies across space and time and goes back to 1840. And we can, detect, we can detect changes in this moral universalism I was talking about and changes in uh, tightness. So I have a postdoc named Max Winkler who's been working on this. And we can watch that change over space and time in the U.S. And you can see more shocks hit. People get tighter. They get more parochial. Then, you know. um, so we, we think we might be able to do that in Europe. So that's our plan to address those important concerns brought by the historians. You said Western church, you said the Western church set off on its reforms because of taboos on marriage, sex, et cetera. Why frame that way instead of trying to maximize requests to the church? Listening to you, it seemed like destroying the large connections of the landed gentry was extremely lucrative for the church. So why not frame it that way? Yeah, and that, interestingly, that's that's how Jack Goody frames it. Um, <clears throat> so, from a, from a cultural evolutionary point of view, uh, I mean, the the people of the time, at least based on the writing, seem to really believe that if they these incest violations, which they thought people were marrying their cousins, and this was incest, this was really bothering God. So, things like plagues were explained as uh, this incest aversion, and that doesn't. I mean, okay, so that might weaken that might weaken elites by preventing them from marrying their cousins. Um, and so, so that could be part of the story here, but then there's the question as to why the Byzantine church and other churches didn't do that. So I like to kind of zoom out and look at all the different religions that are kind of in the general region. So you have various forms of Christianity, most of which don't go this route, so you need a story there. You have Islam, which adopts some of its own practices, but they, they adopt actually an inheritance rule that causes the spread of parallel cousin marriage. And that's why, you know, the Islamic world is one of the rare places in the world where you find people will marry, women will marry their uh, father's brother's son. And uh, so that's very rare. And so that doesn't fit with a kind of um, Machiavelli and I'm gonna, we're gonna destroy the land of gentry because they would have gone another direction. And Zoroastrianism is actually kind of pro incest in the sense that there was lots of cousin marriage and at the elite level, uh, people were encouraged to marry siblings, which is very rare, but um, it's one of the things promoted by the religion. So whatever your story is, it's got to explain why these religions seem to be doing almost random things. I mean, not completely random, but, but trying lots of different experiments. And so the way I say it, this might've had the effects and there might've been bishops or stuff that figured they could use this to their advantage. But the, the overall picture is, is much more diffuse. Thanks. What is the most unusual or most fun data set you were able to use in this work? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. Um, I guess I, well, I, I guess I'm really interested in the Italian case. And that's a case where the cousin marriage data actually comes from requests for dispensations. So one of the things that, one of the ways the church figured out how to make money, which I guess relates to the previous question, is that they could monetize people marrying their cousins. And um, so we were able to get that data there. And then the, uh, the Italy case has always been a question because 
you know, in the northern Italy, you have the Renaissance and you have the beginning of the banking industry. And southern Italy is, you know, famous for uh, exporting organized crime. Uh, so, you know, there's this interesting pattern in Italy. How do we explain that? Everybody's Catholic, right? So one of the assumptions is, is that Italy is a problem for the theory because everybody's Catholic. But when you look at the history of Italy, the northern part is part of the Carolingian Empire. So they get this marriage and family program early and intense. Southern Italy is this much more patchy situation. And they don't actually get brought under the Pope in Rome until after the Norman conquest. Uh, and, you know, Sicily is under Islamic powers. So I think it's really interesting the way, you know, this relatively small region, Italy, uh, has this interesting complex history. And then we can see that history in the minds of modern Italians. China was the technological leader in the world prior to the Industrial Revolution. Can you say more about how your work explains the slowdown in technology in China? Yeah, um, I guess I, I don't, so, you know, I don't have anything to particular to say about uh, the slowdown that happened in China. Uh, it was more, I was more interested in the acceleration. So the acceleration of inventions is really the unprecedented thing. So the speed up in Britain and Europe uh, is what led to this kind of massive breakout where, you know, Europe actually gets ahead of its population in terms of its ability to produce calories. And it gets, so it escapes the Malthusian trap is how a lot of people have argued. Um, I mean, China actually does have a downturn, uh, political changes people point to, it's outside of my expertise. But I think the key thing is that the more interesting part is the acceleration, this kind of massive poor outpouring of innovations and stuff. And so there my case is that something unusual happened in that we have this new, we have these voluntary organizations, we have lots of people moving around, sharing ideas, populations become highly literate for the first time, you know, first time you have this widespread literacy everywhere. So that causes the flow of ideas. And that's what caused this, this change. Is there evidence that kinship systems have changed, evolved psychological mechanisms studied in evolutionary psychology? I think I understand the question. So uh, in the, in the book, and also in The Secret of Our Success, my 2016 book, I make the case that uh, to really understand why kinship institutions are the first and most fundamental of human institutions is because they're built on aspects of our, of our ape psychology. So for example, you know, we have innate inclinations to help close kin. And one of the things that these extensive kinship systems do is they extend that. So there's a bunch of people you call brother or sister who are actually cousins. And it's trying to say that they're like your brothers and sisters and bring them closer. And you have obligations and expectations that are controlled by these norms that uh, make them more like a brother and sister. And one of the things that then brings in is our innate uh, inbreeding aversion. So good reason to think that humans have an innate uh, inclination not to have sex with people who, are, who, are, who, they, who you grow up with. It's kind of like a detector of close relatives. And that can be harnessed with residence patterns and whatnot to extend that by incest taboo to other groups. So it's really kind of monkeying around with the social networks by through these different norms, but incest, uh, incest aversion and um, uh, this uh, helping your close kin. And also we have a pair bonding instinct. So marriage systems are built on pair bonding, which we probably show with gorillas, right? This tendency to build an enduring relationship um, for the purposes of rearing offspring. So those are three features of our ape cognition that we share with other animals that kind of form the foundation with and then monkeyed around with by social norms of our kinship systems. All right, as a data hoarder, I'm worried that we're not collecting key data that will help future societies understand our experiences accurately. Any places we should be looking to collect and preserve? Oh, huh. I don't know if I have a good answer to that. Um, well, I mean, we certainly have unprecedented amounts of data these days. Uh, so now we're digitizing texts. Um, the censuses are becoming available. So one of the data sources that we're using for our innovation study is the fact that we have uh, census and patent data, complete census and patent data going all the way back, well, 1790 for the census. Uh, and patent data goes really far back as well. I mean, I, I guess a lot of the kind of aspects of culture that aren't getting recorded in written sources would be the key thing. Uh, but other than that, I'd have to give that some more thought. 
All right, I think we have one more question. Your maps showed that very little research on psychology is being done in Africa. Is there any funding agency globally that's trying to fill that void? Well, I mean, none that I know of. <clears throat> I mean, that's really interested in trying to understand psychological variation with in Africa. The, the usual suspects for the kinds of places we would go for funding, like the National Science Foundation or the Templeton Foundation, are open to the idea of, you know, they're enthusiastic, I guess, about collecting uh, psychological and other kinds of evidence from diverse societies. And certainly Africa is part of that. But I don't know anybody who's kind of zeroed in on Africa, uh, which would be great um, to try to figure that out. All right, thank you so much. That was such a great talk and great Q&A. And I think we might, uh, I just wanna mention again, um, Dr. Henrik's book. So we'll have that banner up with the book title if you're interested in purchasing. There we go, The Weirdest People in the World. And there's a website, weirdpeople.fas.harvard.edu for more information as well. And I will end with um, just a very brief quote. I know um, for myself, the warmer weather and longer days has um, been very welcome. So just a quote from Margaret Atwood, in the spring, at the end of the day, you should smell like dirt. So I hope you all have a chance to get out there today and go play in the dirt. See you next week. <laughs>